it is so important that your relationship with God is healthy and active when you get engaged in the dating scene. I would say it's okay to be a young man of integrity, a young man of honor, because God has the right person in store. Dude, stop looking for love in the wrong places. Uh, it's not all about the cute. <laughs> You are loved way, way more deeply than you can possibly imagine. Uh, Proverbs is written by King Solomon. Not, not all of them, but most of them by King Solomon. And Solomon's known as a, the wisest person ever lived. God said, you can have anything you want, and Solomon asked for wisdom, but he still made some pretty dumb decisions, didn't he? And it's because as you read it, he lacked something that's called discipline. So when you read the Proverbs, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. You actually need both. You need wisdom and discipline, right? So you can know the right thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean you do it. Like um, earlier last week, I packed my bag with all my gym clothes and I made it to the gym last week zero times. Lots of wisdom, not a lot of discipline. Don't judge me. I'm going to go on Monday. <laughs> and so it takes wisdom and discipline. And so this book is really, it's an older generation writing to a younger generation. This is Solomon writing back saying, here's what I would say to my 18-year-old self. And for those of you who are over 18, I want to ask you that question. What would you say to your 18-year-old self? Solomon, in writing this, addresses my sons and my children. My children, my sons, my son. So this is an older man writing to a younger man. I kind of picture him as being young adults. And uh, because of that, the Proverbs talk about these women. There's the women of the Proverbs. There's the woman that's wisdom. Did you know in Proverbs, wisdom is a woman. Now, no woman here surprised. We're like, I knew that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, but uh, there's also these other women. There's a woman that's called Folly. There's the wife of your youth. There's the adulterous woman, the immoral woman, the promiscuous woman, and the virtuous woman. The Proverbs is written in Hebrew poetry, and it's called parallelism. So we might, we might use rhythm, meter, um, rhyme schemes in poetry. In Hebrew poetry, they use what's called parallelism. And so there are statements that are comparisons and contrasts to help bring out meaning. It's not only used in phrases, but also with the metaphors, hence the wise and the foolish woman. Now, if you're reading this and you're a woman, you can picture perhaps Solomon could write this and address you as my daughters. And so with this, you might have the immoral man or the virtuous man. <laughs> or you can read it as simply it's written to sons and I want to be this woman or I don't want to be this woman. So that's up to you. Um, so some of the things I want you to do is this. I want you to consider in this series um, what it would be like for you to, one, read Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. You could read it in a month by reading one proverb a day. Um, I also want you to seek out a mentor in this series. If you don't have somebody that you'd currently call a mentor, would you seek one out? Um, Proverbs is really, it, it brings generations together. It's one of the things that I've been sensing God speaking to our church is that we're at our best, whether it's kids camp, whether it's youth, whether it's men's and women's compassion, whatever we're doing, we're at our best when all generations are being engaged together. That's what Proverbs does. So who's your mentor? There's, I want you to think about what are your convictions? What are the convictions that you have? They're not maybe for somebody else, but they're for you. And they're wise convictions that keep you out of trouble. Okay, anybody here ever feel like they're making dumb decisions? I was um, 19 years old. I'd moved out of the house. I was so excited to move out of the house. I was like, I can't wait to be free. You know, I can go to Taco Bell anytime I want. And so I was so excited to be free. But one of the things that started to happen was this. I found myself in a place where I was making really dumb decisions. And you know you're making dumb decisions when you're hurting other people. And I had one of those moments where um, I felt like God was telling me, stop making dumb decisions. And I was like, where could I go for wisdom? I felt led to go to the Proverbs. And as I was going through the Proverbs, I um, started, I actually that summer challenged myself to memorize 100 Proverbs. 
Now, the Proverbs are small. You can actually memorize these short statements, and they're so good. As iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another, right? Uh, Without vision, people perish. Uh, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps his mouth shut. There is such, you know, a soft answer turns away wrath. There's really good Proverbs. And so um, I want you to dive into this. We're going to dive into these Proverbs together. And during that season, I felt like God was helping me to, like, this is what look at to have wisdom and discipline in your life. And so this series is going to be, a lot of these Proverbs are going to come from that season of my life. I actually wrote down five Proverbs that we're going to look at today. And so each week in this series, we're going to take a different subject. And so today we're going to talk about staying and falling in love. Next week, we're going to talk about managing your mouth. Some of you immediately going, I know who I need to bring. (laughs) And if you're not thinking that, we're thinking you. Okay. And so uh, also um, we're going to talk about um, Proverbs wisdom for money. And so I I actually think that this has the best advice for finances is the Proverbs. And then we're going to also look at choosing wise friends and how to be a wise friend for somebody else. And so, um, but today let's talk about staying and falling in love. Um, I think the number one decision that you make in life is what you do with Jesus. And number two, in my opinion, is perhaps who you choose to do life with. And I understand as I'm speaking today, there's those who are single, there's those who are married, there's those who are single again. There's people that perhaps on their second or third marriage. Uh, This message is designed to give hope to everybody. Um, If you ever feel like you screwed up too much, read Solomon's life, and you're like, well, I'm not as bad as him. (laughs) He screwed up royally, and I mean literally. And in the Proverbs, what we have here is wise sayings. They're not promises. They're Proverbs. A promise is something that God says, if you do this 100% of the times, so I'm going to do this. A proverb is a best practice. So when the Bible says, train a child in the way they should go, and in the end they will not depart from it, that's a proverb, not a promise. These are wise sayings to help give us wisdom on how to live in a way that God can bless us and we can experience the most amount of joy, peace, and happiness. And talk about what that looks like in our love life. Um, Five Proverbs. Let me give you the first one, okay? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 is a very famous proverb. And so let's go ahead and read it together. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding." Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Some of you memorize that perhaps as a trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Uh, There's this trusting God more than I trust myself, more than I trust my understanding, more than I trust the ways of this world. I trust God. I don't lean on my own knowledge. I trust on God. And that somehow, if I seek his will, he's going to guide and direct my paths, and they're going to be good. Okay? The first thing I would say to somebody in the area of staying and falling in love is this, is who do you trust? I want to trust God. Uh, Growing up, I um, thought that God didn't care about your love life, and that the word sex was something that you should never say in church. Like, I thought somehow maybe God might be against it, I was like shocked to find out not only was God for it, he made it. Like he's rooting for me. (laughs) So coming to this area of trusting God in this area didn't come easy for me. I don't know about you. Maybe you've been hurt physically, emotionally. Maybe, Maybe somehow sex has been something that has been maybe used not in a positive way in your life. Um, trust, trust, was a, trust was a hard one for me personally to come to because I just thought God was not interested. Or I thought this, if I trusted God for my love life, he would actually either make me unwillingly single for the rest of my life as a punishment for lust or that I would marry the beast <laughs> with horns but a really sweet gal. Wherever you are in the season of your life, would you trust God? Now, I also understand this. Our culture pressures people to not be single. It seems like it, doesn't it? If you think there's pressure now, imagine the Bible. 
Bible times, there's so much pressure. It's like this is the only way that you were to live was you had to be married. And if you were widowed, somehow like, like you needed to get married again because there's always this pressure to be married. And there's some myths that were out, out there that I still think exist today. And one of them is this, is that, um, that marriage is what makes you happy. And I'll just say this, if you're unhappy single, at some point you'll be unhappy married. And don't put that pressure on somebody else to make you happy. Find your happiness in Christ. And what you'll find is this, is that you'll be a giver in the relationship, not a taker. Um, I, I would think I'm happier with Carrie, but I actually don't want to make Carrie's goal in life is she's there and she exists to make me happy. And if I have that attitude, at some point she's going to tell me that that's not her job. <laughs> Two. Um, it, it also, I'd say there's this myth out there that says the goal in life is to be married. Actually, the goal in life is to become like Christ. And if you're married, that should be part of that process. But um, there's actually some seasons of your life where uh, all of us have seasons where we're single. No one's like, I'm five years old and married. What's up, babe? I mean, no. So we all have se- seasons of singleness. Some of us have longer seasons of singleness. Some of us have a calling to singleness. And by the way, you, you actually have like this opportunity to serve and go and do things that other people don't have. So there's a benefit to it. Um, and, and you're like, well, well, how do I know if I have that gift? If you don't want it, you don't have it, okay? Um, the third thing I'd say is this, is, is there's this myth out there that says um, that you could do more for God if you were married. And I would just say Jesus did okay. <laughs> Trust God. Trust God. If you're in a marriage right now that seems it's lost some of its happiness, don't rely on your own knowledge. Ask God. Trust God. God, as I seek you, how do we add some energy, some love back, some passion in this relationship? If you're single again, God, I'm going to trust you. That I'm just going to find my happiness in you and you'll direct my paths. But that we're finding that we're looking to God for the, this area because God cares about our love life. The um, second proverb I want to give you is Proverbs 4.23. Go ahead and turn there. 4.23. Let's read it together. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart determines the course of your life. Um, some of you memorized it as guard your heart for in it is the wellspring of life. It's just somehow our heart impacts all of our relationships and all of our future. And um, God cares about your heart. Now, sometimes in relationships, what happens is this, we can get bitter, we can become broken, we, we can, our heart can become jealous, envious. These are enemies of the heart. God wants to protect our hearts from brokenness. I hit a place in my life where I was looking at my dating life going, I'm actually getting better at breaking up than staying together. <laughs> And all of this changed for me, not, 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 not my, none of it changed for me really until I got uh, married and I became a dad. And when I became a dad, the term guard your heart or guard your daughter's heart became really important to me. I remember I sat down with my daughter and, and um, my, she's married now. And I, I said, um, in our family, we have a conviction and, and you can decide whether or not you're going to fall through with it. But it's, it's as a father, what I'm, I'm feeling God's calling our family to do is that's this, is um, to not date until you're 16. And so she waited until she was 16 in one day. And um, then, then I said, I said um, when a guy asks you, hey, do you, you want to be my girlfriend or do you want to go to dance, whatever it is, um, up to you if you want to, okay, <laughs> right? But then you tell him if you want to, if you're a yes, um, to actually come and talk to me. Just say, yeah, sure, I've talked to my dad. There was a Sunday <laughs> where a young man in our church came up to me and he said, Pastor Wes, can we talk? And I was like, we can talk. <laughs> and he, he said, I really like Kaylee. I'd like her to be my girlfriend. I'd like to take her to the dance. And I, I said, okay. Her whole life, um, I have guarded her heart and protected her. Um, I'm going to give you that responsibility for one night. Do you think you can handle it? started to sweat. <laughs> Number two, at the dance, if she says yes, you can dance with her and put her hand, your hand on her shoulder or hold her hand. That's it. Are we clear? <laughs> it's like, what's number three? <laughs> I said, you got great taste and good luck. 
Let me know what she says. There's this like heightened as a dad, like I want every, every dad in this room connected to me in that moment. And I just want to ask you this question. If you fiercely feel that, and I'm sure my wife has a, she'd be able to speak as a mom what that, what that feeling's like. But if you fiercely feel that, how much do you think God feels that about your heart? God is fighting for your heart. He's guarding your heart against all of this evil, wickedness, bitterness, jealousy, coveting, envy, everything that'll steal your joy, steal your peace. God's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But first, let's have a talk. Let's have a talk. I want to guard your heart. Because it will, it will determine the course of your life. The third proverb I want to read you is chapter 7, verse 4. Proverbs 7, verse 4, it says this. Let's read it together. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved member of your family. Remember, this is Solomon, an older man, writing younger men. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved family member. Love wisdom like a sister. Well, I have three. And growing up, if you told me, Wes, you love wisdom as much as you love your sisters, I'd be like, I don't really love wisdom that much. <laughs> Not that much. Not that much. And if you looked at my life, you'd say like, well, yeah, that is true. <laughs> he needs to love wisdom more. Um, there's something about this correlation of learning to love your family will actually make you wiser in your love life. And I, as a teenage boy, I never didn't understand that. Now, if you have in-laws or if you're married, married again, and there's, there's exes and there's different things, learning to love your family is one of the most difficult things you do, and here's why. It's because you see things in your family you don't see other places. Like on a date, no one on a date is like, yeah, I'm just going to be myself, you know? Like, yeah, you may say that, but you're being the best version of yourself in that moment. Honestly, the first date with Carrie, I had a moment where we went to this Italian place with this really rich food, and my stomach started acting up. We're in the car together. I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this moment. I said to her, did you hear that? And she said, well, I go, I think something's wrong with the engine. I pulled over, I got out, I opened up the hood. I don't know how to do anything under that hood. Something evil passed through my body. I waited because I understood. There's this thing called draft. I allowed everything to settle. Then I entered back into the car. That's dating. You get married, it doesn't always, you don't always get out. There's so much that stinks in our family sometimes, you guys. It just does. Let's say it. If you can learn to love your family, then you can be in love with someone for life. And if you can't learn to love your family, at some point, the person you're married to is your family. It's important that we understand the connection of family. When, when I got married, I, I wasn't used to this level of intimacy. My father-in-law came up to me and he said, you know, you know, son, you can call me dad. And I said, thanks, Jim. And... <laughs> Because I just, I, I, I just, I wasn't, I had never been modeled that level of intimacy. And when he called me the first time and said, it's dad, I, li I, I, I said, I think you have the wrong phone number. Because I know what my dad sounds like. And he said, no, no, it's dad, dad, Jim, dad. And that's when I realized this is really hard. Well, when my daughter got married just this summer, my son-in-law came to me and said, it's really important to me that I can call you dad. And I actually had to come to a point where I got to like, it was really hard for me to force myself to a level of intimacy to be able to say, you're my son. Why? If you have family members out there you haven't talked to, would you reach out to them? Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight, make insight a beloved family member. Proverbs chapter 5. It's our fourth proverb. Proverb 5.15. Let's read it together. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. It says, why spill the waters of your spring in the streets having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for, for yourselves, never share it with strangers. 
It says, let your wife be a fountain of blessing. I was like, I remember like being a high school student. I was in church and I was reading this and like the word breasts is there. I was like, God, do you know the words you have in this book? <laughs> is that okay? Drink water from your own well. God's calling married couples to experience intimacy with each other and nobody else and to share this with each other, and to actually drink from the well of love. And here's what's sad is this, is you get married, and all of a sudden you're 10 years, or five years, or 20 years in, and there's no more water. And people start withholding as a tool of punishment. So you're not meeting my needs, so I'm gonna turn the water off. People start looking outside the marriage. And it's unhealthy, it's not, it's not clean water. I have um, some counseling that I do with couples that are getting married, and I have three rules on this, okay? These are my three rules. I'm not saying they're Bible. It's just Wes's rules about sex and marriage. And the first one is this, is um, as much as you can, it's not always possible, and I understand that, but as much as you can, go to bed at the same time. My dad worked nights. I totally get it. But as much as you can, go to, if you can, go to bed at the same time. Number two, sleep in the same bed. Three, sleep with the same person, the one you're married to. (laughs) Same time, same bed, same person. Your odds just got way better. (laughs) What happens in the Proverbs? This man is starting to look outside of, Solomon looked outside of his marriage and destroyed his life. and It'll destroy yours. He starts like, and, and and it doesn't start as a sin issue. It always starts as a wisdom issue. That's why you want to stop thinking in terms of, is it right or wrong? Is this smart? (laughs) So you read about this guy, he's walking the street at night. You're like, dude, you should be home with your wife. He's just walking around. And all of a sudden it says that he's crossing the street. Don't cross the street. And he's like, just kind of like, he's just kind of like strolling around. Going to what? Walking by the house of the immoral woman. We're like, don't go there. He's like, oh, I'm not going in. I'm just going to walk by. I just wanted to see who might be there that I'm going to pray for. (laughs) He ends up in her bed. And you know what the Bible says? He's going to the grave. (laughs) He's going to the grave is where he's going. And what he thinks is going to bring him life brings him death. It destroys him. I want you to know, if you've committed adultery... There's forgiveness in Jesus' name. The Bible teaches us actually that our sins against God are actually adultery, all of them. Because it's a marriage relationship that we are the bride of Christ. And God is jealous for us in a holy way with his love. If you are currently committing adultery, stop. You're hurting somebody and you're destroying your own life. There is hope today. You don't have to live this way. The power of the gospel is stronger than the power of evil. I remember reading it just like going, why why, why is this woman so evil? And you're like, wait, 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 why is this guy walking there? (laughs) The Proverbs is calling us to wisdom. The last proverb I want to give you is Proverbs 31, verse 10. Proverbs 31, verse 10. Proverbs 31 is um, known as the virtuous woman. And um, it's kind of like this long poem about this woman that I think might be inhuman. Because like she like she's at home, she makes all her kids' clothes. She also works full time, makes a lot of money, and she cares for everybody. Home cooks all the food, you know. She's there always available for her husband. And she also, you know, uh, is great at entertaining everybody. Like, so you read it, and sometimes a woman will read it and go like, oh, I have to do all these things. I think you're reading the proverb wrong. The proverb isn't like, here's a standard that you can't hit, but go ahead and try. The proverb is actually a man praising his wife. Verse 10, let's read it together. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. I just really like that verse because my wife likes rubies. (laughs) She's more precious than rubies. So my senior year of college, my friend and I met every Sunday night at nine o'clock for one reason, to pray. We walked the college campus every Sunday night and we prayed. 
And we did it because of this. We were both, each of us were dating a girl that we were serious about, and neither one of us had a job. And we were like, God, we want a job so bad. I beg you, <laughs> by the blood of Christ. We're just like, I want a job. Because I, I knew this. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask Carrie to marry me, but I, I didn't want to approach her dad or her parents. And they're like, how are you going to support her? And I'm like, with love. <laughs> so we're like, give us a job. I remember when I got a job, I was like, yes, there's a God. You're saving up as much money as you can. I went out and bought the most expensive ring I could possibly afford. It would actually cost me more than my car. Like, it was the most expensive thing I ever bought. And I can remember the night that I have the ring in, in my hand, and I can remember asking Carrie to marry me. I got down on what I talked to her parents, asked for their blessing, and they're like, you have a job? I, yeah, I have a job now. <laughs> and, I, and, and I got down on one knee, not two, because that's begging, but one for sure. And, and, and I... I asked her to marry me, and I, I gave her that ring. And remember just how like expensive like that was. I was like, this has to work out, because that's like pretty much everything I own right there. <laughs> well, August uh, 7th, Carrie and I celebrated 25 years of marriage. Yeah, and <laughs> we, we spent two weeks driving around together, and you know, uh, I can say this um, because I, I, I've said it to hers. So Carrie is more precious to me today than she was 25 years ago when we got married. Amen. She's more precious to me than Ruby's. In life, the relationships that you appreciate get better. The relationships you depreciate tend to get worse. In life, as you value people, you speak them up. When you devalue them, you speak them down. At some point, you'll feel like your relationship is worthless. You find somebody, and you give them your heart, and then you hold hands for life, and you say this, you are more precious to me than rubies. If you're married, and maybe today, sometime, or this week, you need to hold somebody's hand and say, you're more precious to me than anything in this entire world. Maybe you're coming out of a failed marriage. You're like, that's why, that's what happened to my marriage. Just, I want you to hear some hope and I want you to hear this. This whole thing is not about human relationships. You get this? Like this is about the church being the bride of Christ and God grabbing us in our brokenness, in our flawed, in our sinfulness, in our discouragement, in our despair, and at our lowest point. Christ came down, put on flesh, held our hand, and said, you are more precious to me than anything else in this world, and proved it on the cross. You'll live life totally different knowing the value you have to God. We're going to worship God in a moment. This is a moment where we get to say back to God, like, I love you more than anything in this world. It's one of the things I love about my wife. She loves me. She's, she, she's an, you guys, if you know her, she's an amazing woman. But one of the things I like about her is that she, even more than she loves me, she loves God. And it provides incredible foundation in our marriage, in our family, in our life. Because we're humans. I say some of the dumbest stuff. There's times where she doesn't know I'm right and won't admit it. Worse, there's times she knows I'm right and won't admit it. We intercede for her. There's times in our family where we do embarrassing things, but our family isn't built on our brokenness or our knowledge or our wisdom. We just decided that our family's gonna be built on the rock of Christ Jesus, and he's never failed us, and he's never failed us, and he'll never fail you. So build your life there. Build your life there. Take a moment and tell God, I love you, and thank you for loving me at my lowest points. And if you need to make some changes, do them. Ask for God's help. God is right there ready to help you, to walk with you, to live his life through you. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. The team's going to lead us in a song. I'm going to have a word of prayer. 
you do, you want to grab your giving envelopes or your connection cards, however it is that you want to communicate with the church and worship God, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, just want to ask you, is there something you need to change today, repent of, and leave behind? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to tell God in this holy place, in this holy moment, that you're done leaving, leading this life that doesn't lead to life. <laughs> and that you want his help, and you receive his love, and you want to be the person that you know God made you to be. And if you've lost some of the passion in your marriage, and you happen to be next to that person, if you grab their hand and squeeze it and just say, let's ask for God's help. And if you do have that passion, that love, that you would share it and tell them that you're more precious to me than anything else in this world. If you're single, just trust God. He cares about you. If you're single again, you need healing in Jesus' name. He'll take care of you. If you're starting on a second or third marriage, God is with you. God is for you. God wants to help you. Build your life on Christ Jesus. Father, we come before you. We're your kids. We're broken. We've made mistakes, but we're beloved. And in this moment, we receive your love. We receive it. We want to feel you. We want to feel your presence. We want to know what that is. Would you? There's just things that have been attacking our hearts. And God, we ask that you would guard our heart and that you would fill us with your spirit and that your love would reign in this church, in our families, in our homes, in our marriages. And we take this moment to worship you. There's something powerful that happens when we sing to you. Open our mouth. Let words come out from our hearts and let them rise to heaven and let them somehow shape and change this community and let it change us. We love you. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Christ's name, the same.